Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, this uh, this notebook is just to uh, have an application of uh, what Francois said uh, over the first uh, first hour, uh, and in particular, uh, see two ways to apply uh, the optimization. So the first way is going to be through a classical iterative reconstruction uh, for the MRI reconstruction problem. Um, so let's start to run things. Uh, So um, in MRI, uh, the data doesn't come uh, directly as an image, like an optical image, but it, it first is acquired in something called the K-space. And the K-space is basically the Fourier transform of the image. Um, and the thing is that because each K-space point, so each Fourier coefficient of this anatomical image um, takes time to acquire, we need to only uh, acquire a certain number of these uh, Fourier coefficients. So that is, we're going to subsample uh, in the Fourier space. Um, and this is a, an in imposed inverse problem. Um, so the first cells are just uh, to, to load the data. Um, I'm sorry, but it, it takes a little bit of time to, to set up the, the whole uh, notebook just because I'm, I'm using some uh, specific uh, functions, but uh, afterwards it, 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 it should be fast especially on GPU. Um, so you can see that the, the data we we're playing with is the um, is a toy data, so it's called the Shep Logan. And here I'm just plotting the magnitude of the image and the magnitude of the fully sampled case space. So I'm specifying that it's magnitude because in MRI we are working with uh, complex data. So it's going to matter a little bit at, at the end. Um, and so a very naive uh, solution for this uh, inverse problem is just to take the inverse Fourier transform with the uh, coefficients that are not sampled um, uh, stuck to, to zero. And so this gives a, an aliased image that you can see here. Uh, so if you look at the magnitude of, magnitude of the, uh, what we call the zero field image. Um, and if you look at the, uh, under sampled case space, you see that here we selected only a few lines in uh, in this case space. So actually, uh, we did the uh, acquisition uh, under sampling by a factor of uh, of four. Here, there is a typo. And so, to to solve this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, first see how we can do it with uh, an iterative uh, reconstruction. So the idea is going to be to solve uh, an inverse problem, a very simple uh, inverse problem. Um, sorry, a very simple optimization problem. And the optimization problem is given here. So you basically have a data consistency term here, um, which is basically related, relating the under sample case space to the original uh, case space measurements. And a regularization term uh, over the total variation of the image. Um, so obviously here you would have to set the lambda, but here we set it for you. And for uh, for this tutorial, what we decided with Francois is to let you play a little bit with uh, the, the code. So here we want you to write uh, the loss function uh, that we would have to optimize afterwards um, in TensorFlow. Uh, so you see that you are um, helped a lot, but uh, you need to still fill in the, the blanks because uh, as is, uh, this, this code won't work. So if I, if I just try to write it as is, I have a, obviously a syntax error. Uh, so you, you need to compute the data fidelity and the regularization. So you already have some uh, loaded functions that will help you uh, uh, implement that, but uh, you need to work a little bit. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of time, maybe uh, uh, three, four minutes. And uh, if anybody has question on, on how to, to write it, uh, please let me know. Um, and I think I got stuck at the uh, setup and import, so I have some error about yeah something in GAUG. If you have the error about the uh, albumentation, it doesn't matter. It is not important. Ah, okay. Yeah, sorry, okay. sorry, I didn't specify it. Yeah, this this okay. error is uh, not important at all. You can just uh, move on. Okay. So maybe not everyone is is used to MRI. Uh, any questions? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, please. Uh, any question about anything uh, on MRI? I, I just 
I, I did with MRI because I'm, I'm very used to it. It's, it's very simple. And according to Francois, a lot of uh, um, uh, cosmological problems are also related to, to the same uh, undersampling in the case space. But if anyone has questions about this specific problem, please ask me. Well, I have a question about uh, what what do we have to do? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you just have to what, what should this data fidelity contain? I mean, sorry, you just said in three minutes. Yeah, I, sure. I mean, uh, I first don't understand what, what's, the, what's the problem. Yeah, so the, the data fidelity is uh, this part here. So this is the uh, L2, uh, L2 uh, difference between the uh, um, uh, Fourier, uh, the original Fourier measurements and the Fourier measurements of the current variable that we are uh, considering for the solution of the, the problem. So here in this case, the data fidelity just have, has to hold uh, uh, the one half of the uh, L2 norm squared between the um, uh, Fourier uh, coefficients, the original Fourier coefficients and the current Fourier coefficients. And the data, and sorry, the regularization just needs to be the uh, image total variation uh, of uh, the current solution. Was, was that clear enough? Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. <clears throat> Can you explain why total variation, what it is and Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so, and total variation, what it is, is, is it's very basic. So um, it's going to take the L1 norm of the uh, gradients of the image in, of the gradients of the image in uh, the two directions. So it horizontally and vertically. So, so basically it uh, favors images that have uh, very flat regions. And so in our case, it's perfect because we have a, a synthetic image with very flat uh, regions. Uh, in real life, it's uh, not perfect, obviously, because uh, the the, um, the MRI images uh, do have a lot of uh, regions that are not necessarily flat, but it has been uh, used a lot uh, as a as a regularization uh, in the classical approach. And it, we are lucky because it's implemented in TensorFlow, so we just have we you can just use it uh, as is from uh, the TF dot image uh, API. Yeah, here, one, one thing I, I wanted also to, um, to mention is that um, we are doing this um, optimization problem in R. Uh, so it's not the canonical way to do things because in MRI, as I said, you're working with uh, complex variables. But here, since we want to use the optimization on, on GPU, um, we need to have uh, a real variables. It's not possible to do optimization on complex variable on GPU with TensorFlow at this point. So we need to stick to a problem where we are working with uh, um, uh, float variables. Uh, obviously, this would not be an impediment to uh, classical approaches, but uh, TensorFlow has uh, other things to offer. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's been uh, uh, two, three minutes. So if you didn't find the solution, it's okay because the, the solution is, is just under, so it's commented out, but uh, you can just replace it. And so you see that here we, we are using uh, so TensorFlow Ops. And, and I was just, just wanted to come back on the, the, the question that uh, Santi had earlier uh, on the reason why we couldn't use uh, NumPy Ops here. The reason is that because we want the loss to, to return something that is a, a tensor as well. And for it to be a TensorFlow tensor, you need to use uh, uh, TensorFlow operations because otherwise it will return something that is a NumPy uh, uh, function and, and so TF function will not understand that and you will not be able to um, to have a proper uh, graph uh, graph creation here and that's what we want uh, to do optimization and to manipulate uh, TensorFlow uh, variables. So now if I if I run it, uh, it returns uh, the uh, the current uh, loss for this variable, which is uh, basically uh, uh, initialized with the uh, zero field reconstruction. So it's the original uh, naive solution. And the second part is that we want to uh, optimize uh, over uh, this loss function with the variable X. So what we need to do 
is that we need to define uh, an optimizer and we need to use this optimizer to perform a gradient descent over this optimization function. Um, so here again, it's a small exercise. So again, I'm going to leave you two, three minutes. So don't worry, it's the last exercise that we will we'll do in this uh, tutorial. Um, and you just need to fill in uh, the two blanks. So first to create the optimizer as we did in the uh, previous uh, uh, notebook. And, and then to use the optimizer to minimize uh, this last function with respect to the, to the variable x that we defined here. And um, so I just want to specify again so that here uh, we are not really allowed to, to use gradient descent uh, for this uh, optimization problem. But uh, in TensorFlow, it doesn't really matter because we can, as, as Francois said, uh, the L1 norm is just going to be replaced by something uh, differentiable using the, the subgradients. Um, and it's going to work just fine. So obviously, it's not going to have the same efficiency as the primal dual algorithms or the, proximity, uh, the proximal uh, uh, algorithms because it, it will not find out about these, uh, these tricks itself. Uh, but it will still be able to perform the gradient descent as is. And in here, uh, yes, uh, so we, we gave you a, a bit of a, an idea uh, of the, the, the learning rate. You can, you can play with different learning rates if you want. Uh, the, the learning rate in, in a um, in TensorFlow is the equivalent of uh, the, the gradient step in, uh, in optimization. <clears throat> I'm surprised that there are not more questions because if I were seeing this for the first time, I would have. Maybe there's questions. too many questions. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, maybe. <laughs> um, feel free to ask, we'll see. We'll stop you when it gets too much. I mean, I'm already lost at the exercise before. I don't understand. Right. Okay. So, how, you, how, you, how uh, this uh, TF cast? Uh, right. Right. So everything uh, and the why? Why is called the mask? And where did you get the mask? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, the, sorry, sorry. The definition of all the variables. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I will. I will go but through. Maybe, I mean, all just these that I've never done it before. So. No, 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 I will, I will go through all the variables. I, I think it's important to, to have everyone uh, following because I think it's important. So, um, so the, the cast is used here because um, we need to um, do the Fourier transform of a tensor. Um, and a Fourier transform in TensorFlow needs to be done on a complex tensor. Uh, in this particular case, as I said, x is actually a float variable. Um, and because we want to do optimization on GPU. And so for the for a transform, we just need to cast it to a complex. So this is what this TF cast complex operation is doing. And in particular here, we are not doing a, um, a straightforward Fourier transform. We're doing an undersampled Fourier transform. And so we need to pass in the X variable. And the mask is actually the omega, so it's the undersampling pattern. So it's the lines that we don't take. Uh, and this is passed as well to the uh, mask for a transform uh, operation. Um, and so the y here is the case, the original case space measurement, and it's the case space uh, variable that you have here. Um, and because all these things are complex, uh, we need to take the absolute value, so the, the modulus of this complex variable, before we take the L2 loss. Um, oh yeah, and, and one little trick is that the L2 loss is already taking into account the uh, one half factor, as you can see here in the documentation. So that's just a, a little trick, but it's not, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's okay if you just add a one half uh, before. It's not, uh, I mean, it's just a one, a, a, bit, a bit tricky. Um, so these, these are uh, all the variables. So basically, the mask is just a uh, matrix with zeros and ones that you multiply pointwise with the image just to, to say uh, which are the lines that we acquire and which are the lines that we don't acquire. Valeria, do you still have uh, some questions? Uh, it's OK. I, just, I need time to, to, to read that. 
Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I do have one on the regularization. Yes. If you can explain what it is and why it's what you said. Okay, sure. So um, here in this um, in this problem, do you, do you understand the, um, this this part? At least the, the the formalism of the the regularization, or is it the implementation that, uh, or is it both? Probably both. Both. Okay. So um, when we want to solve a uh, an inverse problem, um, we have to to use a regularization term because the the pro the, uh, the the problem is imposed, and just solving for the uh, L two loss, so the data consistency would result in uh, uh, unstabi instability and alias images. And uh, this regularization term here is the total variation of an image. So basically what it does is that it computes the uh, differences uh, within an image of uh, one pixel to, to the next one, uh, both uh, horizontally and vertically. And then it takes this, uh, these differences and it takes the sum uh, of their uh, absolute values. And what this does is that it favors an image where the differences from one pixel to, to the next ones, to its neighbors, are not too big. And this is exactly the case that we have here because uh, the, the, the differences between one pixel to the, to the next one, on average, they are really, they are close to zero. And so this is the, the formalism is basically, you can see it as any regularization term, I guess that in a lot of different uh, inverse problems, you have different uh, uh, regularization terms. Here is a very, uh, very simple one. Um, and in, um, in practice, in TensorFlow, you would implement it as uh, by just using the operation that is provided by the TF image uh, API. So it turns out that this, uh, this um, total variation operator is widely used. So it's available directly in TensorFlow. Um, and this is how how we implement it in a in this loss function. Did, did I answer, answer your question, uh, Axel? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So the lambda is just uh, I don't know, like uh, just a factor to smooth the effect of this uh, regularization. Yeah, it's, it's to balance out between uh, how much you care about being consistent with the original data and how much you care about the image looking like a, a flat image with flat regions. So it's basically a, a balance between the regularization and the data consistency. And I guess there is no magic number for lambda. It's no, there is no change so, for yeah. each problem you have. Exactly. So it, it would have to change. And this is basically a, a, a hyper parameter that you need to set. Um, most of the time by a cross validation uh, with a with a grid search it's, i think it's the, the best way to, to set a hyperparameter if you have a lot of data but you can you can sometimes have um, uh, ideas of what it should should look like and I, I think i've heard of some bayesian approaches to set the lambda but i i'm, I'm not too comfortable talking about it because i'm not sure okay. like how they actually work um so maybe we can take a look at the, the solution so um for the optimizer um, so the way you instantiate the optimizer is, is uh, very straightforward. So here the SDG is already implemented, but you can always go through tf.keras.optimizer.sgd uh, to find the optimizer. And here is going to be a stochastic gradient descent optimizer. SGD stands for uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and here we will have nothing fancy, just uh, learning rates. And in the loop, we're going to call uh, the minimize function that you that you saw before. Um, so in the ones you saw before, the, the loss function um, uh, was defined uh, on the spot with a, with a lambda uh, fun function. So here I defined it beforehand. I mean, it's up to you how you want to, to define this function. But just remember that the first argument to minimize has to be a function that returns the tensor that, you're, that you want to optimize on. And the second argument is the list of variable with respect to which I want to optimize this loss function. And in this case, so it's the X variable. And I do it for like a certain number of iterations here, uh, 1000, and I'm going to record the, the loss. 
and it's it's very fast because everything is uh, running on on GPU. Uh, even the Fourier transform is running on GPU, so this is all, all really fast. Um, as you, and you can see that we converged well. So so let's see, look at the solution. And you can see that you, you still have some artifacts from the um, under sampling, but the solution overall looks uh, pretty uh, readable. And now we can take a look at the um, quantitative metrics. So we have two quantitative metrics for uh, the image. Maybe I'm not going to uh, spend too much time explaining uh, uh, what they actually are. Um, but basically, you have to know that PSNR is computing uh, pixel to pixel differences. And the SSIM is more interested in uh, looking at broader structures in the image. And for both these metrics, the higher, the better. And you can see that at least for so PSNR, there is an improvement of uh, the uh, the metric. So it means that the uh, the solution that we recovered with an iterative reconstruction is better than the than the original naive solution. And it's the same thing for the SSIM. So here in this first uh, first part, you, you saw how how you could use um, all the things that uh, Francois mentioned in the previous uh, notebook. Uh, but for an application, or uh, sorry, uh, a so to speak real application, uh, which is a MRI reconstruction. So in the real world, obviously you wouldn't have a synthetic image, but you would have a real, uh, uh, I don't know, brain MRIs or knee MRIs, and you would have to reconstruct them. Um, and obviously this is not necessarily the uh, classical uh, way to, to use TensorFlow for, for MRI reconstruction. I would say that the classical way is to build a, a deep learning uh, model for, uh, for this problem. Because what you can say is that if you look at these two images, you could try to build a model that doesn't know anything about the, the problem at hand, so the Fourier transform or anything. And it just wants to go from this zero field image to this solution or to the ground truth solution even. And for that, um, we can build a, a model maybe, using... Sorry, Zegar, yes? maybe we can stop for questions before... Oh, yeah, sure, sure. And any questions about this first part? I have a question um, where you generate the mask, actually. So it's a bit... Uh... Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So here, I, I uh, generate the mask here. Yeah, uh, and yeah, and you say the accelerator factor equal four. What, uh, like, what does it mean? What is it doing? Oh yeah, sure. So what it means is that it's uh, taking only one line out of four in the case space, so in the Fourier coefficient. Okay. So you can see here that uh, the I take only uh, one line out of four. Okay. Uh, so it's a bit more specific because you see that there is a region in the low frequency uh, in the middle, let's say that is uh, uh, fully sample. Um, so this function here uh, for the mask generation is a bit complex. So it's a function that I use uh, for my other problems. I, I didn't want to go too much in, into details, uh, but uh, maybe if you want afterwards, we can, we can talk a little bit about how to, to generate the perfect uh, undersampling pattern for uh, MRI. But here you just have to know that it's basically taking one line out of four. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's reducing the, the image. Uh, okay, yeah, I understand, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I'm surprised no one is, is shocked uh, about the fact that we're able to solve a TV problem without proximal algorithms. Because uh, when I was doing my PSG, doing this type of thing would have gotten me fired. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight the fact that in 2020, um, people don't care as much about mathematical correctness as long as uh, it works, because we're kind of given up on the whole convexity thing anyway, when you have neural networks. I don't understand what you said. Why, why did you expect people to be shot? Because <laughs> here we're doing a gradient descent with a TV term, which is not differentiable. So this, we should be using a proximal algorithm here, right? Mm -hmm. 
but uh, we here we didn't care. We just wrote down total variation. So we have a total variation term in our loss, and then we take the gradients of that, which shouldn't be defined in zero. Um, but TensorFlow takes the point of view of like taking care of all those singularities so that they, they work fine. So for instance, it either smooth out um, a singularity or just puts uh, the value that makes it be okay. Um, and turns anything that is not cleanly differentiable into something that is kind of differentiable, even maybe if it's not completely correct at this uh, sticking point. Um, and then in practice, it, it works uh, just fine in most cases. So that allows you to write down like the solution of this problem in two lines, um, as opposed to many lines of, uh, of specialized code. Maybe it's necessary for, for this uh, particular thing to, to, to understand that, uh, as, I, as I said, it's, it's just doing gradient descent with its own idea of what the gradient is. And it's, and again, like, like Franck said, it's not doing anything that resembles a proximal algorithm or a primal dual, even if in this term is a function that is not differentiable per se. It just has a sub gradient, but it's not differentiable. It, 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 so mathematically it should use a primal dual or a proximal to be proximal algorithm to be efficient, but it, here it, it just doesn't. <clears throat> um, okay, so maybe maybe we can move on then to to the deep learning approach. And if anyone has questions, obviously about what happened, and if you're taking a bit more time to 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 to, to uh, run through the cells, it, it's completely okay to interrupt me in the middle of the deep learning and to go back uh, to the to the classical iterative uh, reconstruction. Um, so. Um, for the, the deep learning approach, what we're going to see is how we can build a, a model um, and a data pipeline, pipeline to train this model and to solve the, the original uh, reconstruction problem. So um, here in, in this particular cell that you see, you, see you have an example of how to build a, a, a TensorFlow model using the subclass API. So basically it allows you to write your uh, TensorFlow models in an object-oriented style, uh, but you also have different kind of APIs that I, I would be happy to take questions about. Um, but here we're going to focus on uh, the, this particular model. So what I want to implement here um, is a uh, convolutional neural network model with a residual connection. Um, so I think that the first thing that we need to focus on is uh, this call function, which is going to be the forward pass of uh, the, um, the deep learning model. So here in this case, we're going to take as, as inputs an image and we're going to pass it through um, a series of uh, convolutional uh, layers. Each layer is going to be applied on the output of the previous layer. And at the end, our reconstructed image is just going to be our inputs minus what uh, got out of the last convolutional layer. Um, so it's, it's a very, um, very classical uh, deep learning model. I don't, I don't know if I want to get too much into the details of uh, what convolutions are, but uh, you, you can see them as just applying uh, convolutional filters on, uh, on the image and then uh, applying uh, nonlinearity. And so to define the model, what we need to do is to define what those convolutions are going to look like. And so this is done here. Um, so each call to conv2d creates a, a new convolutional layer with a certain number of filters um, and the size of the kernel for this convolution. And then I'm adding just the activation for that function. In this case, uh, it's gonna be the ReLU. So ReLU is just uh, uh, the classical um, nonlinearity used in deep learning. 
Um, so this is the only thing that you have to do to define a, a model in, a, in TensorFlow. Uh, you just need to define the forward pass, and then you need to define the different uh, layers that you want to have in your model. And so in this case, I just want to have uh, convolutional layers, uh, nothing more. I do have some questions where I think it's also because I haven't seen this before. So no, no, please, please go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, I don't know where to, <laughs> where to start actually. Um, but in the, um, yeah, no, let, let me let me look at it a bit more because I I, I was I gonna ask about this um, these filters, but I guess you just explained it, right? No, 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 I, I didn't explain it actually. I didn't go over uh, what the convolutional layers are. I don't know. I don't know if you want to to take some time to 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 dwell a bit into uh, exactly what uh, convolutional uh, layers are. Uh, I mean, it depends on what time we're ready to to spend on, on this because uh, it might it might take some some time uh, to to explain exactly. Uh, I, I'm thinking we would need like an actual neural network tutorial on yes. TensorFlow at some point anyway. So, as you guys wish. Okay. Um, we have another one on uh, deep learning. Yes, I, I, I think to, to, to really explain well the, the, the convolutional layers, it would be best to, to have a, a separate session. Maybe for this, I can just uh, uh, skip, skip this part and, and assume that this uh, uh, convolutional uh, model is just going to be a black box. So I'm going to kick the carrot here. And you can just assume that I defined a a model using the, the subclass API. And I just define what is important to, to understand is I just define what layers I'm going to use and how to use these layers to, from the input, get the output of my model. So that, that, is, that is the main part, that is the, the most interesting thing is that I didn't specify how to perform the back propagation. So how to perform the, um, the optimization with respect to the different weights of the network that I didn't have to specify it. I, I just had to specify the forward pass and specify which layers I'm going to use for my model. Um, then what, what I need to do is I need to um, uh, define a data pipeline, data pipeline for, uh, to train this uh, particular model. So in this case, because my model is, uh, sorry, my, uh, my image that I want to recover is looking like a lot of uh, ellipses together. Uh, I'm going to train my neural network to reconstruct um, ellipses that have been undersampled in the Fourier space. So I just build this, uh, this simple generator to generate uh, um, random ellipses. So let's see what it looks like. So as you can see, um, this generator just generates a, a bunch of ellipses uh, with a, a black background. Um, and I'm going to undersample them in the case space. So um, here um, I am defining my data pipeline. So in this particular case, I am using the TF data API um, to uh, transform one image like this into an actual training example. So uh, here, this would be the ground truth that I'm using, but of course I also need the uh, undersampled image because this is what I want as the input of my network. Because I want my network to go from an undersampled image to an actual reconstructed image. And so I need to retrospectively uh, undersample this image and, and feed it to the network and uh, teach it how to re reconstruct the uh, ground truth image. So this is what this function is doing. This function is taking an image and outputting uh, a training example, which is a pair of two things. It's the input of the network and the output of the network. And so here, all this computation is just to um, uh, generate an undersampling pattern and to undersample the image in the case space. Um, so basically, we, uh, like I was saying, we are uh, going from um, an, an image to a, a training example pair. 
And so, yes, this is the way I am building this. So maybe I'm going to rush a little bit, but this is the way I'm um, I'm building the, the data pip pipeline that I'm going to use to train my neural network. Um, and here we can see what a training example pair might look like. So in this case, it's just a zero field reconstruction. So this is going to be the input of the network. And on the right, you can see what we expect the network to output. Um, and so yeah, do, we, do we have any question on, on the data pipeline? I know I went a little bit fast on it because uh, I, I assume I don't have a lot of time left and most of you are already a little bit tired. So what you call the data pipeline, it's basically how you generate your training things and how you train your network. So no, the data pipeline is just how do you, um, what kind of data are you going to feed your network and you need to feed it two things. You need to feed it the input and the outputs. So in this particular case, what I did was I created a data set from the generator uh, I implemented earlier, which was this uh, simple generator here, which generates uh, uh, ellipses. And so you can see here that it's, uh, it's called here. And then, so this data set now has uh, the ability to generate a lot of uh, images with black background and ellipses in them. But this is not enough to train my neural network because to train my neural network, I need both the input and the output. So what I will do is I will also tell my data set to generate from one image that he knows how to generate a training pair, which is going to be composed of one undersampled image and one ground truth image, so the original image, basically. Okay, so it's uh, basically the data and the label. Exactly, so it's exactly that. So in the case of uh, um, classification, for example, you would have here the image of a dog, and here you would have a label dog. So it's, it's exactly that, it's, it's exactly uh, uh, the data and the labels. And so here in this particular case, you, you, you can say that this is the data and this is the label that we need to, to, to train on. <clears throat> um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, define some metrics I'm going to use to monitor my training. So this, these are again the same uh, metrics that we talked about before, which are the PSNR and the SSIM. Um, and I'm going to this time I'm going to load the model from uh, an already saved uh, uh, version. But if you are, if you have some time, or if you're in a mood for uh, uh, experimentation, you can you can just set this uh, flag to false, and it will train the model. So here I'm just going to show uh, the evaluation. So the way you uh, load the weights is very simple. You just use the load weights function. And in this particular case, I also compiled my model before to tell it what loss it needs to, to use between its output and the ground truth and what kind of optimizer it needs to, to, to use. Um, so you can see that if I wanted to train my model, which is this fit function, I just need to make a call to fit on the data set of training pairs that I created before. And you don't need to write yourself the training loop or anything, it's all taken care of in this fit function. What you need to do is to define your model and define the data that you're going to feed it. And then all the rest is taken care of uh, by, by TensorFlow. Um, so here, of course, so like I said, I'm, I'm not going to fit it because it's, it takes like six minutes or something. It's a very small model, so you can definitely uh, run it very, very quickly. Um, but I'm just going to load the weights uh, from a preview, previously saved uh, uh, run. What I'm going to show though is um, how to, to evaluate the model. Um, so you first want to evaluate, no, oh, sorry, before that, uh, do, do we have uh, some, um, some questions about the, the training? So here I went a bit fast uh, again, uh, but if you have uh, questions about 
either compile load weights or fit, uh, please. Uh, so here when you fit, it's basically the training. Yes, ex exactly the training. This is the training step. The training okay. step is happening here. And uh, do you have any output when you run this function that tells you if the training went well or if you have to, any indication if you have to train more? So you will not have per se indications that, that tells you train more or anything like that. So the output of uh, this call is called the history. Sorry. And history will have uh, the history of the different um, metrics over the whole training. So over the different epochs. Okay. Um, so you can see that here I also uh, fed some uh, uh, validation data to, to the training. So it will compute over the different epochs um, um, the, the metrics over some validation data. And if you use verbose here, you will have um, the evolution of the different metrics as well printed to the, to the console. But you have different methods to, uh, to monitor the training and to monitor the efficiency of the training and to know whether you need to train more or not. Um, so you can plot the history. You can use something that uh, Francois mentioned before, which was a tensor board for uh, something, uh, so for different things related to uh, monitoring the, the training. Uh, but I, I will not, uh, I don't know if I, uh, I, don't, I don't think I will mention the, the, the callbacks here. So the way you would use tensor board to monitor the training, because I think it would be uh, uh, too long. Um, but I mean, do you have access, for example, to the loss function? And if can you see if it converts, for example? I mean, do you have access to this kind of information? Yes. So um, this uh, history uh, um, variable that I just created here, which is returned by the model fit, allows you to plot afterwards the loss function uh, during the different uh, during the uh, the training of the model. Okay. So you, you do have access to it, and you also have access to the different uh, metrics that you define yourself, and that you. Uh, used in the compile of the model. Yeah, okay. And you also, you, I mean, in principle, uh, from, what I, from what I've seen, uh, you can also access the accuracy and uh, check, for example, how it changes uh, in the training and in the validation set. And I guess that, I mean, here you would generate the validation set also with the generator, right? With yes. The image data yeah. generator. So exactly, so here in this particular case, we, we don't have uh, such a thing as accuracy because accuracy is a term that is, uh, I mean, accuracy is a metric that is mostly used for um, classification uh, or regression. But here we have MSC, we have PSNR, and we have SSIM, which are all the different metrics that you can have access to. And so you can definitely have access to those metrics and even accuracy where in, you are in the context of using accuracy. Um, and you have here validation data and uh, you can also compare so the the different metrics that you have for your training data and for your validation data. So this is definitely something that you can do uh, with uh, with TensorFlow. You're right. And from what I remember, but again, I've only seen this applied to classifications things like I don't know distinguish between cats and dogs, the the classical uh, uh, problems, but. Um, uh, I remember that, uh, for example, you could really plot uh, all the layers uh, of your uh, convolutional neural network uh, through your history variable, through the model uh, layers, and really see if there's something strange that uh, happens after each of the layer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so I, I am, I'm not sure what you, what you, what you mean by uh, with this question, but uh, so what I can say that is that, as uh, Francois said, so you can definitely plot the graph that is representing the model uh, in TensorBoard, um, but to have- I think you can really plot the image. Uh, like if you, if you have an image as an input and then you apply uh, convolutions or, uh, or other, um, I don't know, max pool uh, to compress the image, you can really uh, plot the within the, 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 like by saving this as you did in the history, you can use that to plot every single layer output as an image and see what are the features which are still uh, left after many layers. 
that's what I remember. But I don't know. I've oh, seen okay, okay. only in the classification, so I don't know if. No, no, no. I, I understand. So, so to, to do this, you would have to do, um, I think, some things that are a bit more custom uh, to to um, to look at how the model is uh, generating. So you would have to to implement, for example, uh, another function in, in the the model. So you would have to do like, for example, uh, a uh, output for uh, layer uh, y, and you would have to to call the model up until uh, the, a certain layer to, 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 to output it. And this output, you, you, you would be able to use it in uh, a different callback, so which are things that I didn't mention, but you would be able to use them as the training goes to have a list of the output as a certain layer during the training. And so this is sort of something that is totally doable. And I imagine that it's very useful when you want to do classification to look at what is uh, the output of each layer uh, during the, the training. So this is something that is totally doable uh, here. But you, but you would have to be a little bit more custom because it, it doesn't, it's not uh, off the shelf. Um, and so here, what, what I can do after I, uh, I train my model or I uh, loaded the weights from a previous run is I can evaluate it. So I can evaluate it uh, qualitatively. And to evaluate it qualitatively, I just need to uh, use the predict method of uh, my model. And in this particular case, I will use it on the uh, zero field image. So this image, uh, I just need a little twist because I need to shift uh, the image by uh, 0 0.5, uh, but uh, it depends uh, how you define your uh, data. And so here, this is the, the kind of image that we, we have as, in, as output. So you can say it is not as good as the total variation uh, output. There are different reasons why, why it's not that good. Uh, the main one, I think, being that uh, the, the, training, uh, the training set is not representative of the actual image that we're trying to, to, um, to evaluate on. Um, so obviously, it's a shortcoming of your approach if you don't have uh, the training data to, to, to then uh, uh, solve, solve your, your actual problem. Uh, but you can also um, evaluate uh, quantitatively. And this is done via the evaluate method of your network. And for this, you just need to uh, specify the input of the network and the output. And you can see that uh, the uh, uh, PSNR and the SSIM of the of the output of the, this, uh, this network is actually not that bad, I think, compared to the previous, uh, previous results. So for example, we gained a little bit in SSIM and we lost a lot in PSNR. But obviously, I mean, we shouldn't look at the quantitative metrics when the qualitative is, is that bad. But uh, this to give you an idea that there are some things that neural networks can do better even if they don't have the right training data. Uh, I don't think it's a compelling example of that, but uh, it's just, a, just the idea. And so, yeah, I think this is uh, pretty much the, the end of, uh, of uh, this tutorial. Uh, I just have uh, different functions to save the, the model. If you want to play a little bit with the model, if you want to change some things, uh, if you want to train it yourself. So if you want to train it again, you just have to do faults here. And, and then you can, you can run the model. Um, as you can see, uh, it will go through each epoch and output the PSNR and the SSIM while the network is training. Um, so it's, it's pretty convenient to see that you didn't do anything wrong. Um, okay, so, so do you have uh, any question? Maybe Francois, you have some uh, concluding comments or? That's it, just to, yeah, the, the point was to show you that you can use TensorFlow for doing deep learning, but you can also use it for doing classical things. It doesn't need to be deep learning. <clears throat> so uh, on that, for people that are, uh, I would say, like used to uh, the SciPy optimized environment, would you say that it's difficult to switch to the TensorFlow one? And would you recommend it? Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. But uh, if you if you don't have a, a, a complex model with complex gradients, uh, don't 
don't switch to TensorFlow. Okay. So for simple application, it's uh, easier to just uh, use side by. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. If if you just have like one function to find the optimum of, uh, that's not a good idea. It's a good idea if you have a complex model uh, and writing gradients would be a pain. Okay. And uh, um, for neural network, I heard about Keras that uh, let you build your network in a maybe easier way than uh, just using TensorFlow uh, function. Uh, is it some? Is that something similar for uh, optimization problem? Uh, you mean you mean like a higher order library? I mean a higher level library yeah. for. Yeah, so there is this, um, do you know CVXPy? Nope. It's, right, so it's a, it's a library for convex optimization uh, from the good people at Stanford, and they have just made a TensorFlow version of that, which is pretty cool, and you should check out. Um, and what is super cool about it is that you can embed inside your TensorFlow comp computation, like, you can think of them as a layer in a neural network, but they actually solve the problem um, and can be, it can be an, like in this case, solving the MRI problem with an actual proximal solver as part of a larger uh, TensorFlow computation. Anyway, so yeah, check it okay. out. TVX fine, TensorFlow. Okay. okay, thank you. And we've been using Keras here, just in case that wasn't super clear. Yeah, yeah, I have saw some uh, call to Keras. Yeah, because I, yeah, the, the, so Keras was originally a different package than, than TensorFlow, but um, since uh, the 2.1 uh, version, uh, Keras is actually the, the main endpoint for TensorFlow. So you can just, when you say Keras and TensorFlow, now it's almost the same thing when you talk about deep, uh, deep learning. 